Hello. Welcome to Teaching Artistry with Courtney J. Body. That's me. This is a podcast that celebrates artists and advocates for community engagement. And this is We Can't Go Back, a video series in partnership with Creative Generation meant to examine, interrogate, and confront racist policies and systems in the arts. This series amplifies leaders in arts and culture who drive radical change in communities through anti-racist and liberatory practices. Subscribe to the Teaching Our Issue with Courtney J. Body YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I identify as a Black cisgendered woman. Pronouns are she and her, hers. And I am uplifting and paying respects to my ancestors from across the African diaspora who have been stolen from their homelands and within the U.S. all across this country. And they are holding me right now and I can feel them. I live in Brooklyn and um, these are the stolen lands of the Munsee, Lenape and Canarsie nations. And I pay respect and uplift and the uh, indigenous diaspora that are woven into my history and DNA through a network of solidarity and love from the Cherokee, Uchi, and Creek nations. I'm very, very excited to welcome our guests uh, who are a part of our panel now. It's the panel discussion. Uh, Takima Bunch-Smith and Jody Dresner Alprin. Hi, everybody. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Good Courtney. Morning. <laughs> Good morning. It's a, it's a stressed, hopefully stressed out, I mean, meaning out and away morning, mm-hmm. but uh, we can all just be where, you know, come in where we are, are right now. I know I'm super tired, but I just mm-hmm. am so thankful for you to join me in this conversation. Um, so why don't we um, have you share your role in arts and or education. Good morning, Courtney. Thank you for having me. Um, I also am tired despite sleeping many, many hours, which is my body telling me that I've been holding a lot for a long time. So thank you for just um, inviting us to actually bring our whole selves in this morning. My name is Takima Bunch-Smith. I identify as a Black cisgender woman. My preferred pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm also in Brooklyn, so also on the land, stolen land of the Lenape and uh, Canarsie Indians, excuse me. Um, And I also want to just lift up, as I was thinking through this, my ancestors, yes, who have been, were stolen from Africa, half of my ancestors, where I don't know what country they were stolen from and then uh, settled and worked the land for free in the South of the US, but then the other half of my ancestors rose up and killed their masters and got their freedom um, in Haiti. Uh, So I wanna also honor them because both (laughs) their blood uh, runs through my veins and I realize that now more than ever before. Um, And so I work, um, I'm the president of ANASA Educational Consulting, excuse me. Um, Really happy to be here and uh, wanna pass it over to Jody. Thank you for having me. I am Jody Dresner Alperin, also in Brooklyn. So also on the stolen land of the Lenape and the Canarsie. Um, I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, I am a white Jewish woman. Um, And it's interesting hearing you guys talk about your ancestors. I have definitely in recent weeks been feeling uh, my my ancestors who fled Eastern Europe and Russia um, in uh, escaping um, pogroms and religious oppression um, and also uh, my ancestors who did not. Uh, and who perish under a fascist regime. And I've been thinking about them a lot uh, lately and definitely feeling their presence as well. So thank you, Courtney, for that just uh, space to acknowledge that, that that's part of what's going on in our moment right now. Um, I'm the artistic director of Off the Page, which is an arts education and theater company. Um, we sort of, we have two arms. Uh, we work <laughs> when, when there was in school We work in school, uh, in residencies, tackling curricular topics through the arts. Uh, And then we try to take the the issues that students are most passionate about uh, in school. And for our second arm, we create new theater work with and for youth. Uh, And I also, uh, along with Takima, have been a member of New York City Opt Out, where we've done a lot of advocating um, for getting rid of Uh, racist high stakes testing in our public education system um, and a lot of work around other educational issues of access and equity. 
Well, like I said, um, I'm very excited to have both of you on. Um, so I'm engaging in, uh, I think it's 17 weeks, is that right? Um, a, a series of um, sessions from TYA, that is hosted by TYA USA on anti-racism. And the two of you took on the first two sessions that I attended. Um, I have yet to see number three, but I'm going to. I'm, can't, I'm actually excited because I did get to see those folks speak live at, an, at a conference two years ago. But you both were laying the groundwork for us to be able to do this work. And it was, it was focused on um, those who make theater for young audiences. But I, I dare say that the work that, you're, uh, that you've been sharing actually could go for a larger, wider audience. Um, but I want to thank you very much for taking on such a big endeavor and for doing it with um, uh, the amount of, of uh, like wholeness and realness and authenticity that this work requires, I think. Um, there were a lot of people on there that, you know, either this is their first framing or this first entry point into this kind of work or thinking in this way or feeling uh, and allowing themselves to feel. And I thought that you both did um, a, a really great job at being able to embrace that and invite that. So um, I, with that, I have this question. So as we are embarking on these journeys, um, both personally and institutionally, let's focus on the institution. So um, I work for a, a theater that, uh, is, I work for an organization actually that does a lot in theater, um, but what are some concrete actions that arts institutions could take um, to dismantle oppressive systems, policies, procedures that are deeply embedded with white supremacist cult cultures, really just changing their environments um, in ways that are meant to uh, um, impact where it's better. Yeah, I can start um, because I'm, uh, my comments will probably be more general, um, which was kind of our point, which you just uh, brought up in terms of laying the groundwork and then Jody can like really dig in um, in terms of the specific <clears throat> arts world. Excuse me, I'm having a little allergy <laughs> issue this morning. Um, and so I think for me, whenever I hear questions about what do institutions need to do and what is the systema systematic, you know, dismantling and restructuring, I immediately go back to what makes up a system and what makes up an institution. I start going back into like the things that make up institutions are people. And so you cannot shift an institution if the individual people within an institution have not done their work and put themselves on their journey or continued pushing themselves along their journeys and then created a vision of what a liberated institution would look like. And so for me, I'm always starting with the individual to say, do you understand what white supremacy is and how it lives within you, meaning every single person within the United States? Have you thought about how race and racism impacts you and your life and the work that you do as a professional, right? Have you thought about that? And do you have a plan of working towards dismantling that for yourself as an individual and then yourself in your professional role? If everyone begins to do that, you actually then can create a vision for an institution which will create systematic change. And so that's what I really wanna encourage people to do. And it's what I think Jody and I were really trying to convey in those first two sessions um, that we did for Theater for Young Audiences series is that you can't jump to the institutional piece without having begun and continuing to do the individual work of dismantling it within your own self and your own life. Um, so that's actually what I would offer us as to begin. I, I would agree with Takima. And I think go like building on that, uh, I think for white folks in leadership roles in these institutions and things like that, like part of what we have to just say is like, we don't actually know what conditions need to be created to make our spaces welcoming and celebratory for um, black and BIPOC lives, because that is not our experience. Um, and so it's all well and good to sort of create uh, a plan of what we think it would look like and how I, I think that that would make you feel comfortable and in part of it, but then that's still being created by my lens and I'm still the gatekeeper of all of those things. Um, 
So I think there, uh, one of the hard things, but one of the things that actually moves us forward is understanding that it's a process. There's not like some checklist that we can be like, I'm going to do A, B, and C, and then I'm done, and I fixed racism in my institution. Um, but it has to, the most authentic work that we can do has to be in relationship with the people that we say we want to be working with and making work with and for, right? And if we're not building those relationships and having the really like down and dirty, serious discussions with people about where we've had missteps, where we've caused harm, whether it's intentional or not, it doesn't really matter. Um, we, we can't be trusted to be changing our institutions into a place that is welcoming and celebrating. So I think that it's, uh, I think, we don't want to use that as an excuse not to take action. I think that there are actions that we can be taking right away. Um, I think, you know, evaluating our seasons uh, right off the, off the bat and like really doing an inventory of um, who's being represented in our playwrights, uh, in our devising, in who gets to then direct those and who gets to direct uh, some of our more traditional uh, um, choices. Um, what is our, what are our creative teams look like? Who are our designers? And are we bringing them in at the beginning of something that we're building and we're built, we're really as a team building together or are we making decisions and then sort of getting token folks to the table later? Because those are different stories. And so looking at our own processes and sort of backing up and saying, if we're going to start building again and building better, um, where are these relationships? And, and we have to be honest, maybe we don't have them. Maybe we have not done a good job of building them. And our very first work has to be an accounting of that and possibly an apology to artists in our circle um, who we have not been uh, you know, inclusive and building together um, to start to build those relationships so we can start to build those teams. It's way more interesting to have a project that has like, you know, all different kinds of folks at the table from the beginning, but you have to build trust to be able to do that. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's this, it's a, it's a cycle. Like we have to continue as white folks doing the work ourselves and we have to be willing to be in conversation and building relationships with BIPOC artists at the same time and to listen to what they're asking. And if they say, here's the thing I need, then we have to say, okay, and do it. And then if it doesn't work, we can go back and reevaluate it and say like, what would make this better? How can we improve it? But we can't be like, well, we need to have a panel and we need to have, you know, a study and we need to have, there, there needs part of building relationship and part of building trust is I think for folks to see us taking those actions when they bring them to the table. I don't know that that was a very clear answer, but I don't think, I don't think it's a clear, I don't, I don't think there is a clear answer. Exactly. Can, can I just close one loop right there? Because I think like I, everything that you're saying, it makes perfect sense. And here's how it ties back to what I said. So you can bring by POC folks to the table and have them be directors and writers and actors and still replicate white supremacy and racism and anti-black racism. And so folks, when you're doing the work and everyone is doing the work, you will reduce the chances of your doing that. But if you think you can just have representation without that work, internal work for everyone, you're still gonna have what you have. And so that's kind of the point, self-work, institutional work, ongoing, messing up, reassessing, reevaluating, that is the work. I thank you for that, Takima. I, and Jody, I, you were sort of leaning into the next question, so I'm gonna adjust it just slightly based off of what you said around um, you know, I work for a predominantly white institution led by a, a, a white person um, and an executive team that representatively is white, mostly white identifying. And um, that question around harm is a, is, is, a, is a big one. We've been doing some analysis on the We See You White American Theater and um, trying to figure out like, what does that mean for our institution who is not specifically Broadway, but is, or off Broadway, but is a part of the theater world and in the, in the industry. And that work that you're talking about, Takima, Takima around um, the personal journey into, and how that then pours into your professional life. Those two things, those two threads, I'd like to figure out how to pull together again. Um, be, or pull at, I guess, a little bit that 
the kinds of conversations that I feel like I'm having with white identifying people and are very different than the conversations that I'm having with people who identify as black indigenous or, or people of color. And I don't, I'm curious about how do we bring these conversations together? So Jody, are you having conversations with your, as, as Takiba says, get your cousins, <laughs> when you're in with people that are in your community who are white identifying? And if so, what, what are they talking about? And Takima, like how, how do you have any ideas for how do we bring, I, I'm curious if it's needed to be a table, if there's another sort of metaphor, like a campfire or so, I don't know, but how do we come together so that we can be, be able to be our true authentic selves when having these conversations without fear of retribution, which is a big, big challenge, I think. That is a big challenge. And uh, I think, Yes, I'm having those conversations with my cousins, um, for sure. And I think that, um, you know, part of the work is like understanding that we're meeting everybody where they are, um, but also not giving them a pass for staying in that place. Like, you're going to be where you are, but we all have to be moving forward, wherever our starting point is. Um, and so for those of us that have maybe been on that path for a little bit longer, we have to take on the role of gathering more of us. Uh, it can't just be that we stay in, well, I'm doing my work and I'm looking at what I'm doing in my organization. We have to continue to call in more of us, especially in the TYA field, like we're such a white field. There's so many of us who are, um, you know, holding positions of power and things like that. So we, we have this dual role where we have to be having conversations that y'all don't need to be having with us. Like, please, you know, I can imagine that the conversations that you have, you know, if Courtney and Takima, if you were having this conversation separately, it would be different. There's a lot of burden that is put on our BIPOC colleagues and artists. And part of the role of white people in that is to take away some of that burden. We're not going to be able to take it all away. But some of it, some of the work, if people are just starting out and, and they're, they're learning and some of the things that they're going to go through as they learn, they have to deal with their own emotions, they have to deal with their own guilt, whatever. Like we, that doesn't need to go on to our, our BIPOC colleagues. Um, that's too much uh, on top of too much. So we have to do that and we have to be trying to have these authentic conversations so that, you, so that we start to build spaces where you can bring your real self to the conversation for, for the, our BIPOC colleagues. Um, and that, I think, just takes a really long time. But uh, I, I think a lot about, um, I know, Takima, you're doing the workbook kind of on Resmond Menachem's My Grandmother's Hands. And he says outright, like, we have to do the work in our own groups before we can come in together. Because what I'm holding in my white body is really different than what you're holding in your black body. And we have to do this body work, um, this, you know, like hundreds of years of trauma on all sides that manifests itself different in, depending on what kind of bodies we walk around in. We have to do that work before we can come together and do the, that. Um, but Obviously, you know, as a, a, an artist, I want to get to a place where we can be authentically collaborating together. I want to be creating stories uh, with all kinds of folks and telling all kinds of stories and stories where all kinds of kids can see themselves. Um, and we have to, you know, imagine what that could be. And, and a lot of times I think for white folks, it's going to mean seating the table, perhaps, Courtney, right? And saying like, maybe it's not a table, maybe it's not a theater, maybe it's in a neighborhood where kids don't normally go to theater, you know, like maybe it's in a place where we've been policing their bodies in the seats, but now we're celebrating, you know, wiggling bodies and clapping and hooting and hollering and, and, and it's gonna be for white folks to feel uncomfortable with that because of our conditioning. And- I I, Can I just pause for a second? Yeah. At, so the New Victory has education performances. That has always been like what you just named, like the celebrating, the authentic verbal responses, moving in your seats, wiggling. Like we want that. And, and I don't understand, I, I, but I do understand the policing of, of, of kids within a theater environment, but, they're, but they, ha they experience being policed constantly. So why would we as theater professionals want to continue to perpetuate that when we're bringing them to the place that we think is the best place on earth 
It doesn't make any sense to me at all. Right. But maybe then, and especially like because we have this moment of the pandemic, but like maybe then what does our theater look like? Maybe it's not a stage and seats inside and like maybe it's a whole different, I don't, I don't know, you know, outdoor like thing that we're just imagining now in this moment. And I think that if we can continue to do this work, you know, where white folks are calling one another and in doing the work that they need to do without putting any of that on our BIPOC friends and, and collaborators, and trying to build these authentic relationships, then I think there's hope that we can start to imagine what that is together and like what kinds of stories we would be telling together. But white folks have to be really honest about what our role is and like what our gatekeeping is on what stories are getting told and who gets to tell them and what's deemed appropriate or not appropriate or worthy or money making um, or any of that. And, um, and understand that we don't have the answers. Like, Somebody else, somebody else knows this. Like, let's talk to them. What story should we be telling? Like, I don't know, but let's talk to people who know. There's so much there. I'm not even sure where to jump in. Um, so in, at the risk of going on too long, I think I'll just um, point out a couple of things. One, the last point you, that you just brought up about what could theater look like reminded me of, I think, two summers ago when I went to see an interactive Shakespeare play. Um, I, well, I can't remember which company put it on. Do you remember the name of it? New York Classic Stage, right? The one where they travel around yes. outside? Yeah. yeah, I think that's it. It was like the most fun like art experience I've had in a really long time because after every scene, we all got up and moved to another part of Battery Park City and sat that we changed directions. We had different, you know, at one point the Statue of Liberty behind was behind us. At one point there was some you know, person like renting on New York City streets behind, like it was just so amazing. I loved it. It was really accessible. Um, so yes, reimagine. I mean, if not during a pandemic, then when might we, you know, like <laughs> I need a t-shirt that says that. Um, but as you were talking, I was just thinking about um, how, how if we're going to look, if we, you were to take educational levels as an example, you know, from preschool to post-secondary master's degree, by POC folks and Black po folks in particular, we have like 16 master's degrees when it comes to race and racism and white supremacy. And collectively, generally speaking, white folks are like about to start preschool, right? When it comes to be eight, being able to recognize themselves as racial beings, be able to have a common knowledge and language and understanding of the impact of race and racism on their lives and the country that we live in and our history and all the institutions, right? Like it, it's just beginning. And so having it, for, even for folks that have been doing this work for a long time, right? There's just always more to uncover because every single part of your socialization has been racialized and you don't know it. <laughs> So like you might know some parts of it, but then you're still like, oh my God, like everything, there's no, there's a hundred percent of my life has been impacted by race. And that's really hard for white folks to understand. You know, I do training and we ask people how much of your life has been impacted by race and white folks are usually like zero, 10, 15, even people that say 90 and a hundred still tend to talk about it as like, you know, I have a racist uncle or like, you know, and still not recognizing, no, actually it's like me and my white racial identity, right? And people of color are usually 100%, usually black people are like 195 and then by IPOC, non-black people of color can be a little bit lower, but generally high. And so when you realize that, then you realize why it's so damn hard. <laughs> it's like, we're not even coming at it with the same knowledge base with the same history, with the same experiences and acknowledgement of that experience, the same um, understanding and knowing that a racist society privileges and gives advantage, right? And a sense of internalized superiority to white people and does the opposite for black people and POC, that's a recipe for where nobody's gonna get it, right? It's gonna be hard. It's also a recipe for black people and um, other people of color to withdraw. And so when I think about that, I'm saying, do white people understand what is lost 
by them not engaging in this work, mm -hmm. I don't think they understand what it means to not have people at the table. Let me tell you, I watched SNL last night and I said that shit was the funniest. SNL was so boring for a long time. I'm look, I'm not in the field. It's okay. It was so boring. And now look at all these people of color on SNL. I was cackling and I, and I was like, you don't even know what you were missing. Right. And that's just like one example, but on a deep level, not being able to understand that you have been centered and your experiences and perspective has been centered literally at the blotting out of the majority, like people of color, the majority of the world, right? Let's just be really clear. That is a huge loss. And so once folks start to actually recognize that, I would hope that gives people some incentive to say, I have, you know, not full touch of my own humanity, number one. And number two, I'm not living authentically as a human in community in a world, right? That is about humans and human connections, which impacts the creation of how we tell our stories and how we do our yes, art. I just want to say, no, white people do not know. I just want to like uh, uh, answer that. I know it was a rhetorical question, but like, no, they don't know what they're missing. And it's, um, you know, it's one of the most frustrating things because not only do, do we not know what we're missing, but we are so adamantly holding on to the idea that we know best um, mm -hmm. about what things should be. And if we could just pry our fingers off of that thing that we're holding on to, um, the world opens up in such a, a amazing way, especially for artists, like at the get go for artists, like we have to keep driving towards that. So let's go, so let's go into that. Let's, let's say, I love this metaphor that you just laid out to Kima around like black people and then um, people of color are at, at like it, it, multiple masters <laughs> or, or, you know, striving and getting there versus preschool um, for white identifying folks. And, and again, I understood that that was general, but let's say that, you know, people actually move up and we get to a closer, closer together in our knowledge and our journeys. What does then a, a racially just liberatory world at look like let's just like allow ourselves and our theater selves and our you know just imaginative creative people let's try and imagine that so to even run with that metaphor right so it's not there's no judgment associated right like oh look you have master's degrees in your preschool i'm a preschool person i think early childhood is the most amazing time of child development so we're not looking at preschoolers like oh these are all the things you don't know and we're gonna like beat you up for it but what happens when a child obtains language, right? And a child speaks for the first time or speaks in sentences or breaks the code for reading and is able to read. We are like, oh, wow, a whole new world opened up. A whole new way of interaction, interacting exists. We can have conversations in ways that we didn't have, right? And so like, I think we could follow that metaphor and know that we are in, we, we have been placed in these differential places by socialization and history and, and structures of oppression. Um, and so then now what are we gonna do to try to, to unpack it? So I just keep thinking like, what does freedom mean, right? And so if I'm walking around oppressing people and I don't even know it, I'm not free. So I've been oppressing people who are gender nonconforming and trans for a long time without even knowing it because they were invisible to me. That identity didn't impact me in any way until it did. And someone was like, I'm gonna call you out on that. And I was like, oh wait, what? <laughs> like, I don't understand, right? So then I was like, well, let me go and understand because I'm not gonna ask you to explain it to me, right? And so I'm starting to do that work. I am starting to dig into the discrete um, community, the disability, critical theory around disability and recognize what, you know, how am I oppressing people? Like, I'm not free and I wanna be free. <laughs> So that's part of like, when I say like, how do we envision what to do? It's like, we, we actually need to all be free and we cannot be free when people of particular identities are experiencing oppression and harm. And even if it's not, you know, death and, and a very low life expectancy, for example, black trans women live to be 35, that's like insane. 
how are we living in this world? And that is okay. Like it can't, I can't sleep at night thinking about that. It should be that way. We should all be so upset. Um, um, so that's kind of my point is first, like just really defining freedom very broadly to know that it must include everyone. And it includes when people just can't be their full happy self help selves at all times right like to be able to be not like this black person that experiences oppression and has all these statistics but like this black person that is like amazing and wonderful and centered and i am joyful and i love being black and i love raising my black child and seeing all the things that he's doing outside of the gaze of white supremacy you know and that's like that's going to take a while that is definitely going to take a while, but that is where I'm working towards in terms of what does liberation look like for me and my community, my family, and also for the society when we can all literally be our full authentic selves without consequence and judgment and qualifiers. <laughs> Takima and I talk, we, we talk about this a lot. Uh, I will say like, I, I think, and it's not to say that it's a small part of it, but just to say it's a different part of it. Like their systems work. We have to be working on dismantling systems at every level that impacts our lives. Like every kind of system, our education systems, our criminal justice systems, like their systems work and that that's like a specific thing. So we're just sort of putting that over here and understanding that that's part of it. But in terms of like the stories that we tell and the art that we're making, Takima and I talked a lot about like what specifically, like from a white lens, what does it mean that black lives matter? Like we have, it's so, you know, there's been so many people who have taken up the call, taken up the mantle, which is really positive. And we need to make sure that we have a really good understanding that black lives encompass all these things that Takima was talking about. Um, so even if we look like within our field and, you know, even, you know, so my work, we have a story, All American Boys, and it is about race and racism and police brutality came out specifically from black youth who wanted to be telling that story. But I have to make sure that those are not the only stories of blackness that are being told by students that I work with, right? Um, because I, I need to be doing the work uh, for white folks and in the white, you know, TYA community to say there, you know, if we can celebrate somebody getting a tea set, a white kid or, a, or an animal getting a tea set and make a show about that, we can sure as hell celebrate something else that's wonderful in a black child's life that has nothing to do with getting stopped by police or being profiled or anything. There, I think there's a place, obviously, for telling those stories. And I think there's work. And I'm, I'm grateful to all of our collaborators of color who have worked with us to tell that story. Uh, but I'm also really interested in like what other stories we want to be telling and, um, and celebrating the full spectrum of a life, not just you know, uh, an, oppress an oppression that goes on. So I, one of the things that we've been doing, like we, we have, you know, students that we've worked with who are now like actual adults, which is crazy. Um, but we stay in touch with all of them. And one of the things I think as a, as a white leader, I use that term lightly, but that you could be doing is we've been reaching out to all of our folks and say like, what are you working on? we're a tiny, tiny company. We don't have a lot of resources, but like what of our resources are going to help realize what your project is. Um, and that's super exciting because they're working on all kinds of things and also saying like, and we don't have to be involved in it at all. You owe us nothing of this project, but if our, if anything we can offer is supporting, you know, and we've had kids be like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this podcast, so maybe we could talk about that, or I'm making this documentary, which also is like that idea of expanding what we mean by theater, mm -hmm. um, because we work with youth, and it's a whole landscape of technology, especially in this moment of the pandemic, uh, and things like that, but they're picking things that they want to be talking about, and I want to be supporting that, and I want to be using whatever privilege and levers we have to amplify that work and make sure that more people are seeing it. Um, and, you know, that we can, you know, go on and on about what that, like if we're in the field, we do a lot of adaptations that, you know, happens to be a specialty and of our work. Um, but what does the publishing industry look like for young people? Where, where is race and racism playing out there? Whose stories are being told? Are those stories really representing that fully lived experience like Takima in one of her 
uh, Lives runs this amazing um, Black Lives Matter in Early Childhood Education Conference, which if you get a chance to check out, um, you absolutely should. And just to see what a celebration of Black life and tiny little lives, because they're so adorable, looks like. I think every white educator and artist working with children should have to be, you know, take it to go back to our metaphor, should have to be taking those courses to move themselves down the road um, and to move out of the preschool there. That's like, you start to see that and you're like, oh, this is what, this is, here's my language. Now I understand. Now I can have this conversation with you because I have this whole new language about uh, what this celebration of a full life looks like. Well, I want to thank you both so much for um, just, well, one, just being here, obviously, and just for making us, um, giving us really big, juicy things to think about. Takima, did you want to say something? Oh, no, I, so I was just thanking Jody for calling out the Black Lives Matter at School Week Early Childhood Symposium. And I can certainly share the links with you all to take a look. And we have a couple of videos and we actually have the live stream from both years and all the speakers are up so people can see what she's talking about. That was actually the most common comment feedback that we got from white people who attended is that um, they said that they had never realized how much they don't see black children from a strength-based perspective that they, and these are like educators, policymakers, principals, parents, um, people who work with black children in particular, even they were like, I did not understand that I was like, everything I was doing was from a deficit-based perspective. So most people actually said, I need to shut up and listen and learn. That was like a huge catalyst moment for people. So thank you, Jody, for calling it out. I'm really proud of that work. Yeah, I would love to see that as well. That's something that we're always striving for with our um, teaching artists and, and how we working we are working with schools. And in fact, that we actually utilize some of the um, the work that you all provided in the slideshow when doing some training with our teaching artists and specifically talking about race and racism as a starting point for those conversations. Um, and at Takima, it's not lost on me that you have a t-shirt or, or some sort of shirt. I can't tell if it's a t-shirt. Um, that says Rihanna Taylor, say her name. And so as we're wrapping up here, um, we're saying Rihanna Taylor, we're saying George Floyd, we're saying um, how important it is to continue to say their names. But what I heard you say um, here, but uh, and, and, and in the webinar, was that it, we, yes, we know of, of them because of how they died how unjustly and horribly and horrifically they, they died, but they were so much more than their death, right? And this is part of the, the meaning behind this podcast is around we can't go back because we have to stay moving forward. And the work that you both are doing, both together and, uh, and separately, um, and helping others to engage in this work is helping us to move forward and making sure that we don't go back. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you for this work you're doing. Thank you so much. And I want to lift up Tony McDade, also a black trans uh, man that was murdered in May. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for watching. Um, this is also being recorded for our audio podcast. So we'll be there. If, if you haven't already subscribe to um, Teaching Our with Courtney Body on the SoundCloud. You can find it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And as we are saying here, we won't go back, we can't go back. Onwards. Now is my time to shine. Let's go. When your time comes, don't postpone it. When others doubt and out, you don't condone it. Truth be told, yourself is your toughest opponent. When your moment comes, grab hold and own it. Never let go, stand tall and hold tight. Overcoming obstacles is the objective in life. Doubt is overnight, and onto them you shine bright. Cause inside your head, on goes the light. Ignite.